I see that all members of the board are here, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. And uh, we'll start with comments from the executive director. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of uh, public comment announcements and then an update on a request that you made of me last week. Um, first, we're currently accepting uh, public comments on the University of Vermont Medical Center's mid-year budget adjustment request, and that information can be found on our website under our public comments, as well as the um, public comments that we've already ha have been have received are posted there. Um, we also encourage, as I've um, mentioned for the last year or so, that um, folks who are interested to provide public comment on a next potential model with CMMI. And all of those comments that we receive, we share with our partners at AHS and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on the next model. Um, last, I want to provide an update to you on a request that you made of me last Wednesday. You had asked me to uh, write a note to DIVA and uh, AHS to ask if they had any updates for us regarding um, availability of Medicaid rate increases or one-time funding to address the requests where we, we have received from our hospitals uh, for their mid-year rate requests. As of this morning, I do not have that letter for you. I will keep you updated as the day goes on, but I did want to report that out to you. And that is all I have to report unless you have questions. Thank you, Susan. So with that, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Patrick Rooney to tee things up. Patrick. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Can you see my screen? We can. All right, excellent. So good morning, board members, stakeholders, and members of the public. Uh, I want to start by just ensuring, Kim, you can hear me? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us on this uh, sunny second to last day of March. We are here to uh, discuss again the mid-year rate request for Rutland Regional Medical Center. <clears throat> By now, we're familiar with the content of the factors that the board uh, shall take into consideration for this process. Uh, as Executive Director Barrett alluded to, uh, public comment has been open for this process uh, the entire time, whether it be specific to Rutland or now UVM and Central Vermont's uh, request for amended budgets. For Rutland specifically, we've received, uh, as of last night, uh, nine overall public comments related in total or in part to Rutland's request. Uh, several of these comments cite both Rutland and uh, UVM Health Network requests. So where Rutland was specifically mentioned, we made sure to include uh, in this uh, slide page here. Uh, and you can see some of the participants. Uh, we also had several members of the public who either uh, did or did not want their comments shared. If they did, uh, those will be posted and can be found on the Green Mountain Care Board website. If they were not, then they were just sent to board members as well, but we want to acknowledge the receipt of those in this process. A couple of changes from last week. Uh, we took a, another try at trying to uh, flush out the specific inflation factors as it relates to uh, Rutland Regional Medical Center uh, for this amended budget. And so we took a stab at trying to segregate some of those, and I'll talk a little. I'll talk further about that as we make our way through. Uh, it felt like the board was having trouble distinguishing uh, which uh, components uh, were one-time components and which components were uh, lasting. Uh, and so we'll talk more about that as we get into the slide deck. And then we also added a financial comparison analysis of Rutland uh, versus its state PPS peer group and the Fitch peer groups uh, that we used in the budget process last year. And so we took Rutland's Q1 information across some high level uh, financial indicators uh, to show you where they're at as of Q1 versus their peer group in Vermont at that same stage and then versus uh, the Fitch peer groups uh, as we'll outline later on in slide 20. So trying to provide some alternative perspectives to you to uh, help you feel confident in the decision that you are uh, trying to make today. So by now we know the uh, order of battle here for 
Rutland Regional Medical Center's request and the nature of that request. So I'm not going to go into great detail on that. Um, we're very well aware of what this uh, means for Rutland as they've brought forth to us and in several interactions over the last couple of weeks have continued to uh, provide timely information to uh, our request for feedback. So I do want to extend a thanks for them for taking the time to respond to our many requests that have helped us navigate this process over the last couple of weeks. Again, uh, citing some of the financial items here, <clears throat> uh, Rutland's projection currently puts them at a net operating loss of $7.6 million. Uh, their estimate for uh, kind of an excess uh, loss this year would be almost $12 million as things currently stand. Um, <clears throat> And then their uh, proposed 9% rate increase would bring that operating uh, loss to about break even. Uh, however, with their current forecast, the uh, total loss on margin would still be around 4.5 million. Uh, and you can see the different uh, variances that we've put here according to budget and their current projection and their projection with their rate increase. All information that you are familiar with uh, to date, as this is our uh, third iteration of this discussion. Uh, again, just MPR levels where the hospital has historically performed, showing the increase that they're experiencing uh, on behalf of that MPR component, <clears throat> and then uh, where that would go with the proposed rate increase if uh, approved in full. History of operating margin, again, a hospital that has uh, reported positive margins, uh, most likely not as uh, robust as they would uh, prefer. However, uh, as a standalone entity in this environment, they've performed uh, relatively well uh, in that regard. Uh, again, days cash on hand. This does uh, also have within it, as we've discussed, Medicare advances that are padding uh, those figures the last couple of years, uh, but those are beginning to undergo uh, reclamation. So that will continue to come down. But overall, the organization does have a relatively healthy days cash on hand in comparison to its peers. And again, you'll see that in the comparative analysis that we did on slide 20 as we navigate towards that. Rutland's change in charge. Uh, currently, they're in the middle of the pack. Uh, we did hear discussion last week about the uh, 2017 uh, negative rate adjustment that was uh, approved by the board. Uh, and we've been calling this out all along that uh, as of the fiscal year 22 process, uh, that negative 5.1% did fall off of this five-year look. So admitting that uh, the five-year look has its strengths and also its weaknesses uh, in that there was that significant adjustment made just a few short years ago. Uh, but for the most part, Rutland currently falls right in the middle of the pack on change in charge, uh, both in the five-year average and five-year median of Vermont hospitals. Taking a look again, the five-year and where that approved nine, the potentially approved 9% would bring Rutland uh, for historical base increase in 2022, and that would be 12.64%, which would put them uh, right at the top of their peers on the five-year average and five-year median, uh, elevating them in that five-year look. Again, that is a, well, there are limits to that five-year look as we know, uh, so take that uh, as you will <clears throat> in providing some context. And then last week, we went through some of how Rutland was looking to distribute these rate increases, uh, both from a gross and net revenue uh, perspective. So I'm not going to review all of these again, but they did provide uh, some analysis for the board based on a board request to uh, see how that was going to be applied to service lines. And they also did their own comparison to some of their peer hospitals in the state based on those rates. So slide 17, getting into that inflation component analysis. So what we what we did was we asked Rutland uh, to go back and populate the inflation table that they populated for their fiscal year 2022 budget. And that's what you see on the screen here. And so what Rutland did was they factored the increase, the percentage increase, the dollar value of that increase, and how that increase affects the overall operating expense budget. So you can see there that wages and compensation for medical staff represent 11.8% of their total operating expense budget for fiscal year 22. And the same goes for these other major inflation factors. Now, these are all factors uh, that they did cite in this request. Uh, and so they are pertinent to this. And then what we what what happens is it takes a weighted average based on that percentage increase and that percentage of total operating expenses. So we can see that on average, 
uh, Rutland's fiscal year 2022 budget as it relates to these major categories had an inflation factor of roughly 4.4%. And so what we were trying to do was we were trying to show, okay, that's what they planned for. With, with respect to these specific categories, what are they now experiencing? So we also asked them to populate based on their projection where they see these items going and how they're impacting uh, that experience that they currently have. <clears throat> and so on the next slide, you'll see what they've populated for us. So a pretty significant change in the percentage increase um, and in the dollar value as opposed to the previous slide. Uh, and for the most part, the percentage of total operating expense in that uh, middle category there doesn't move materially, um, but there are some changes. And so that's going to affect the weighted average. And you can see that the weighted average for these categories comes out at about 10.5%. And the Rutland called out some of the one-time retention components that are driving specifically those two wages categories. So that got us thinking. Uh, it, it seemed like the board was struggling with uh, the thought that a rate request, which is going to be built into the base in perpetuity, may be covering some items that are one time in nature. And so what we wanted to do was provide a little bit of a different perspective to flush those out and see what the increase is without those one time retention bonuses, which I believe we heard from Rutland's leadership, they're looking to phase out um, as they begin to plan for uh, tackling some of the uh, the uh, workforce issues that they've, they're have they coming up against. So even though those retention bonuses were necessary on behalf of leadership to retain their staff they, in an effort to keep uh, contract staffing uh, as low as possible, uh, they are uh, relatively final in nature uh, and they will not be reoccurring. So if the if certain board members were concerned about uh, building in a uh, base increase to uh, Rutland's budget, which will remain there forever, even as some of these costs uh, come to a close, um, <clears throat> perhaps we could provide you with a little different insight and context based on that uh, to help you in your decision. And so the next slide We've done exactly that. We've looked at the inflation percentage increase that they budgeted for and what is being projected and the variances. So you can see that on the far left. And again, the inflation categories are mirrored uh, to what were on those previous two slides. And then the dollar value. <clears throat> and so you can see the difference here when we do the variance to budget in the middle that wages and compensation for non-medical staff are exceeding their budget expectations by 7.1 million. However, as we pan to the right, those one-time adjustments are making up for a significant amount of that. And as those uh, begin to subside, uh, board members may be concerned that any uh, rate increase that they may want to give Rutland uh, is going to stay there, and yet these costs are going to go away. So we did some adjustments based on that and in the adjustments column you can see <clears throat> what that what that unplanned or unanticipated increase looks like without uh, those one time incentives and so the total comes from 23.2 million dollars down to 15.3 or a variance uh, of about 8 million dollars so <clears throat> from budget so it is still in excess of budget by $8 million, the total of those columns, um, but we wanted to segregate out some of those uh, one-time incentives. And so if you're looking to provide a lower rate increase, uh, we hope that helps get to that space uh, where <clears throat> you can provide something for Rutland, acknowledging that uh, with, with as it relates to uh, wages that Yes, there's about $4.9 million or so combined in those two categories um, <clears throat> where there's been unanticipated increases. Uh, so from budget, however, uh, that number becomes much smaller because that adjustment actually brings down medical staff lower than what was initially uh, planned. So what we have here across drugs and medical supplies is drugs are coming in a little bit lower uh, but medical supplies are coming in significantly higher from a price effect perspective. And then, of course, contract staffing 
uh, is the largest of the unanticipated components as it relates to the, these uh, various categories. So hoping that provides some additional perspective to you as you reach your decision today uh, to understand that some of this is uh, one-time decision making. And if you feel that uh, the leadership at Rutland uh, needs to essentially own that and it shouldn't be shifted to in perpetuity to ratepayers, then we hope that helps you get to your uh, a place of comfort in your decision. So we kind of dovetail this <clears throat> with uh, a comparison of Rutland as of Q1 to its Vermont PPS peers. So there are uh, five other organizations uh, that have a uh, PPS or subset of PPS designation. And so you can see here <clears throat> uh, through Q1, that uh, the peer group is uh, outperforming Rutland. Uh, they are also outperforming Rutland uh, on total margin as well. And however, when we get down into days cash on hand, you can see that from a reserve perspective, Rutland is uh, well in excess of their peer group in the state of Vermont through Q1. And then some of the cash flow items, days payable uh, and days receivable, they pay their bills slightly later than their peer group, uh, but for uh, cash collection purposes, they are slightly under or right on target. Uh, and then debt service is uh, significantly in excess of their peer group uh, as of Q1. Now we know things have changed since then, as we heard from last week. Uh, and then their level of indebtedness <clears throat> uh, is right on point with their peer group. And then when we shift over and compare them to hospitals in Northern New England of relative size, uh, for that uh, Vermont peer group there uh, and in the Northeast in general, which does bring in some much larger organizations, but we wanted to spread out the region to uh, capture uh, as many organizations as we could, some of relative size, some larger, some smaller. Uh, we can see that uh, from first quarter to those uh, 2019 comparables, which are slightly out of date, uh, however, um, Rutland is not quite performing up to that peer group. Uh, in operating margin, but through Q1 and total margin, uh, they're meeting that Northern New England uh, peer group and they're slightly under their Northeast comparison. However, still days cash on hand, even though we know that 244 has some padding uh, from those Medicare advances, uh, they are still in excess of uh, their peer group for Northern New England and Northeast. And then their days payable and receivable, uh, they they uh, pay their bills slightly later than their peer group, but their cash collection is well in excess of their peers in that space. And then their debt service coverage, again, uh, well in excess as of Q1. And you can see that uh, the northern New England hospitals and northeastern hospitals in that peer group uh, carry a higher level of debt uh, than Rutland Regional currently does. So <clears throat> that concludes uh, the additions to the analysis here. Um, the next couple of slides uh, really just get at some of the past questions that uh, we've posed to Rutland Regional and the answers, so th there's nothing new in that space. Uh, and then we have the suggested motion language for uh, the board, uh, should you choose to reach your decision today. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you and your fellow board members for discussion. Thank you, uh, Patrick, and I'm going to open it up for to the board to ask questions of either Patrick or of Claudio and Judy. And before I do that, Kim, if you could swear in Claudio and Judy. Yes. <clears throat> Would you please raise your right hands? Do you swear the testimony? Oh. OK, I thought I was muted. Do you swear the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. I do. Thank you. OK, so board members, uh, it's now open for comments or questions on the Rutland Regional Budget. Well, quite a quiet group this morning. <laughs> I can go first. Um, Thank you, Robin. <laughs> sure. So, um, Patrick, could you go back to the 
inflation slide, which I think is 19. Oh, yeah, that's the one. So um, in terms of the contract staffing, I know that the there's been significant pressures related to the traveling staff due to the pandemic and inflation. Um, but I think when I think about that, I also think about that as um, a time limited, hopefully, uh, expense, because I, I think there's work from uh, Representative Welch's office in terms of um, concerns around price gouging in that space. And I think we're all hoping that the travelers costs will come back to what was a pre-pandemic level. So when I think about that as an additional one-time expense, um, for me, that would mean that the baked in costs would come down to uh, 975, about thousand, if taking into consideration if the contract staffing was more at budget. Um, which I think would be closer to a 1% rate increase. Um, so I guess my question is, so I just speaking for myself and where I am, um, you know, I certainly want to thank our staff and I want to thank Claudio and Judy for their very res responsive, um, clear uh, testimony and um, for providing us information as we work through this. I do think this is a tough decision um, as a mid-year rate increase in particular because it does have unanticipated impacts or anticipated impacts that were not anticipated for employers um, and for um, particularly self-insured employers who the rate increase does get passed through since they're self-insured. You know, the insurance, commercial insurance space um, I would expect probably to see that, you know, I would expect to see those in the next rating in the next premium rate review hearings. Um, so there would be a time lag on those. But for self-insured employers, this would be um, another economic pressure that was not anticipated. And I think everyone has those. Uh, certainly hospitals are seeing that, but also other employers um, and families. So. I think where I'm landing is somewhere uh, between denying the rate increase and 1%. So I'll just put that out there for discussion. The other well, board members? Could I respond to um, that? Yes, Judy, go or, ahead. Okay, thank you. So. Um, I just want to be very clear um, in our projection in those costs, and we have not loaded those costs in at the rates that we were paying at the height of the pandemic. And that is really, um, you can observe that in the inflation increase percent, the 124% uh, over where we were. We have cut those rates back. They're not at the rates that are above the $200 per hour. Uh, they're they're closer to about $150 per hour. So I just want to be clear that we didn't carry those high costs throughout the projection. Um, and and that is, you know, why you're not seeing even higher rates there. Thank you for that clarification, Judy. And, and Mr. Chair, can I also add to that? Proceed, Claudio. Um, you know, also, we don't anticipate Although workforce is really our top priority, rebuilding our workforce, um, we don't anticipate being back to pre-pandemic levels for the use of travelers for quite some time. And the trade-off is either we have to do uh, what we've seen other healthcare organizations do and, and limit or close some uh, beds, or we have to pay travelers to come in and provide those that staffing until we're able to do that. And there's, um, we're working, as we testified previously, very hard with the colleges and universities 
uh, and other pipelines to, to do this. However, that's that's a longer term fix. That's not going to happen, um, you know, in the immediate future. OK, other board members. I'll go next. Um, <clears throat> so my take on this kind of broadly is that um, and I think it might be for all these mid uh, budget adjustments is that um, I would rather this unfold in the context of the normal budget process as opposed to this ad hoc process, unless there's something of a critical, critical nature that that needs to be um, supported. Um, this is a very volatile uh, data environment. Um, I'm noting that your um, non-operating revenues uh, uh, relative to what was in your 22 budget were at 5.5 million and at your projected budget, they're down to a negative 6.7 million. That's a $12 million swing. And to me, I mean, that's not where necessarily where we're going to end up, but those are somewhat uh, tied to the market and, and are volatile. Whereas in the normal budget process, uh, we have uh, the opportunity to the legislature's gone home, so we know uh, uh, some things there in terms of maybe met Medicaid. Um, we have uh, um, the uh, um, um, I'm looking here at um, my little list of things that you know maybe the travelers will have diminished. Maybe we'll have the all pair model too. Maybe we'll have a two year budget process as in something that we'll be discussing this afternoon. Um, so, I, you know, I uh, the thing that caught my eye is your bond covenant, and that is one thing I think that needs protection. Um, and uh, you, uh, as I kind of followed the numbers as best I could, you know, your your co your bond covenant ratio is at 1.4%, um, and I think now you're at 1.79% uh, um, coverage. <clears throat> And uh, so I would be open. Kind of, it's kind of in the same ballpark that uh, you know Robin is, but for different reasons. I I, I would I, I I think it would be a very very bad uh, event and a long lasting event if that bond covenant was breached. And so um, if there um, if a one or two percent increase um, would allow. Uh, and, and the numbers I've seen that a 2% one would allow you know, a little over a million dollars additional cushion, you know, to protect that, uh, th that bond covenant relationship, that makes sense to me. But otherwise, to me, we're, you know, I mean, this is all fee for service, for example, this rate increase is all fee for service. Whereas in our normal budget process, we're trying to diminish fee for service. So as much of this that can be pushed into the 2023 budget process, which is right around the corner. I mean, af after this meeting today, we're going to be talking about the final version of the guidelines for the 2023 process. And and uh, so I want to get to that so that we can see this holistically. Um, and uh, um, but I, I un understand your uh, concern. It's. Uh, very scary to be in the top of something like this, you know, where, I mean, for me in my career as nine years as finance commissioner, it's scary to be in, in these positions. And I sympathize and the work that our team has done and your team has done has been very thorough, but that's kind of where I'm landing is in the one to 2% uh, uh, range. Thank you, Tom. Other board members? Hearing none, I'll open it up for public comment before we uh, ask for a motion. Is there anyone from the public who wishes Kevin, to comment? Go ahead. Just, Kevin, I have some thoughts, but I was waiting for you and Tom to reflect on what you were thinking about this before I responded. So I wasn't sure where you and Tom Walsh stood on this. But, <clears throat> thanks, Jess. I don't have any. Um, I appreciate the staff's work with the, with uh, the the um, additional information. 
Um, and I appreciate uh, Claudio and Judy um, and, and their, um, their working with us and the professionalism they brought, their responsiveness. Um, but I haven't seen any information that swayed me from what I said last time that this isn't an unprecedented situation, a business that does hundreds of millions of dollars of business facing tens of millions of losses um, isn't unusual. And we're moving in healthcare toward capitated or fixed payments and shared risk. And this is, this is what shared risk can look like. Um, and I worry about uh, Rutland Regional and their ability to weather something like this. And when I've, with the staff's help and on my own, looking at um, their financial position compared to hos similar hospitals, um, they're, they're right in there. They've done a really good job managing themselves prior to this to be in a position where this looks weatherable. Um, and I'm... Um, all the concerns about a mid-cycle um, increase that Tom and Robin have um, already said, I agree with, and I'm hard pressed to find to find a reason to move toward um, granting any increase. And so that's that's where I am right now. That's all. And I guess, Jess, you 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 believe that you have the uh, privilege to uh, hear from all the other board members first. I'm trying to make a decision, and it's helpful to hear everybody's um, perspective. It, I think this is a really, really tough decision. I don't take it lightly, and it's helpful to hear where everybody else stands with all the information that we're given. So I don't think it's a privilege. I think it's just I'm trying to understand where everybody stands. Yeah. So the reason why I didn't comment is I thought that uh, – um, what I would say had already been said by uh, board member Pelham that uh, I don't support mid-year adjustments, but I do have concerns and I don't think that any hospital should be um, playing chicken with uh, a bond covenant. And that's why um, I would be supportive of a, a minimal increase just to tide them over because I think the more appropriate time for the um, thorough discussion is at the actual budget process. So um, if I could be convinced, um, as Tom Walsh had just said, that uh, my fears of a uh, uh, breakage of a covenant are unfounded, then I would be voting to not give them anything. But I, I have not reached that point. Okay. Well, I mean, that's really helpful. Um, <clears throat> excuse me for coughing. I'm going to try not to cough when I speak. Um, but so I guess, you know, I, I appreciate all of the comments. I appreciate all of the thought that our budget team has done and, and the, the, um, receptiveness of Rutland to all our additional questions. I, you know, this actually has been keeping me up at night, literally my cough and these decisions have been keeping me up at night. Um, I, you know, obviously negative margins are not sustainable. Inflation is real. We have to make sure that our hospitals have the resources they need to, to deliver the care. Um, I'm worried about the summer budgets this summer. I anticipate that, you know, these, these rate requests that we're seeing now are going to be magnified in the summer through summer budgets because hospitals aren't immune to the inflationary pressures that we're all experiencing. Um, I think, you know, where I'm struggling and why it was really helpful to hear everybody's perspective is one in the timing of these rate increases and two what types of cost growth a commercial rate increase should cover and um you know i think slide nine the one that is is up on the screen right now is really telling um when i look at the unexpected expenses that are driving rutland's requests you know, there are a fair amount of them that are one-time expenses, um, $8 million in one-time retention bonuses that won't be carried forward. I appreciated Judy's comments about um, the traveler costs and Claudio's uh, comments about that. The expected, you know, traveler's costs are going to continue probably uh, for the next year or so, but I'm not sure that it's going to, even with 
a reduced rate, um, we did hear in the hearing that there is an expectation that those travelers costs will be going down. Um, and the hope is that it's going down. So I, I'm landing where I don't think it's reasonable to ask commercial rate payers to absorb temporary and one-time labor costs in perpetuity through this unplanned mid-year 9% increase in charge that's forever baked into the rate. Um, and in terms of timing of that rate increase, I think you know, if we think about unplanned mid-year adjustments of that of a magnitude of 9%, they're going to disproportionately impact those with the least ability to absorb that blow. You know, if we think about small businesses, they may have 30 days cash on hand if they're lucky, and households are living paycheck to paycheck. And so, you know, in terms of the timing of a rate increase, who can absorb the blow? <laughs> Um, and how do we think about, you know, those unplanned mid-year rate, rate requests? A lot of conversation has been around reserves and when do we use reserves and, and who has reserves? Um, I guess in my mind, hospital reserves are there to cover capital investments and one-time temporary investments in human capital uh, to retain and support a workforce that qualifies to me as a capital investment. Uh, as the slide, one of the slides that Patrick showed, it does suggest that Rutland has sufficient days cash on hand relative to its peers, certainly far more than small businesses and households do. Um, and so, you know, I was help, it was helpful to hear what everybody else is thinking. Hey, right? I, everything all right? Sorry. Uh, if, if you're not speaking, if you could mute yeah, yourself, please. Um, so uh, I, I can't support, I'm not sure if people can hear so, me. It looks like uh, 802238. Um, you need to mute yourself. And uh, so we are now designated agents, and my broker is in the middle. And Robert Hoffman, you're coming through as well. Please mute yourself. Sorry. Okay. I think you're okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I guess I can't support a 9% mid-year rate increase based on uh, particularly, you know, some of the updated information from Rutland. I can't support temporary and one-time costs baked permanently into rate. Um, I had hoped for, for news from AHS this morning. I would like to think that there's some federal and state relief dollars available since I think a lot of these one-time workforce expenses are linked to pandemic pressures and there's been considerable federal dollars flowing into the state to, to relieve some of those pressures. So I'm still optimistic that maybe we'll hear some good news from AHS that there might be some relief dollars here um, to support this because I recognize these are costs that the hospital is incurring just can't bake it into permanent rate and I can't bake it in a mid-year adjustment and have that impact um, be disproportionately felt by those who don't have the ability to absorb that blow. So where I was curious and and um, wanted to hear more from other board members was, you know, what rate, you know, between zero and it sounds like zero and two percent, one and a half or two percent might be supported by the board. And um, I think that perhaps I could land there too. Um, I think that probably one and a half to two percent would reflect some of the more permanent increases in inflation driven expenses that Rutland will carry forward. It will also um, protect their debt service coverage ratio, which I think is important. Um, and around a you know one and a half two percent also would bring Rutland's change in charge actually up to the weighted average increase that all hospitals received in in 2022. We recall Rutland actually came in with a lower than average rate request um, and a you know very very conservative budget. So you know I could probably be convinced that something of that magnitude um, would could be supported. But I'm not sure the juice is worth the squeeze at that point in terms of the the transactions and billing, you know, issues of of uh, putting that into place. And it might be better to delay it till um, budget season. But I, I don't know. So this is where I, it was really helpful to hear everybody's perspective. And Jess, it's very helpful to. This is Tom Walsh. It's very helpful to hear yours, and you. I think you laid things out very nicely. And I, I, I still worry, and I I don't want to be the curmudgeon of the bunch, but I still worry that even a one to two percent increase, as you outlined, is going to fall on people with people and organizations with much less in reserve and much more difficulty paying. And I'd rather see this 
uh, work its way through the usual cycle. As the peer group comparison has shown, Rutland Regional is in um, not great shape. Everybody's suffering, um, but relatively good shape compared to peers. And the direction that we're going with changes in the way healthcare is paid for is to deal with fixed payment, fixed payments, and sticking to a budget, um, and sharing risk. And and so I, I I find the information informative, but at least for me, um, not enough to come off of denying this increase. So I, I I appreciate how you laid things out. You've said it um, the best that I've seen it, but it's it's still. Um, there's a time and a place for this um, where we can go through the our, our usual um, processes and Vermonters um, know when to expect it, can plan accordingly. Um, this, I, I'm, the timing of this is very troubling to me. And the troubling, the timing is troubling, Tom. Um, but the reality is, is that inflation is hitting everyone, and we can't naively think that um, this workforce crisis is going to go away soon. This workforce crisis is going to take multiple years to address, and um, the 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 bad position that uh, we're in today is that we can't say definitively that. Rutland um, will not fall precipitously enough um, through their uh, burn of their day's cash on hand to trigger a bond covenant, and yet we can't also determine um, what that proper safety cushion is, and that's what's troubling to me. And I, I agree. I came in. Um, with the attitude that uh, no increase is warranted unless it can be proven that the bond covenant would be violated, and I, I just haven't seen that proof. I'm also, um, I had hoped, um, as you requested the last time, um, that we would have heard back from um, from our colleagues about what. Uh, COVID specific relief funds may be available. We still don't have that information and voting for 1%, 5%, what have you, without knowing what what may be there um, specifically for something like this. I, th I think that's a function of this um, mid cycle request. Um, the, it, the timing is very difficult. We're pushing to get that information. We don't have it yet. Um, so there's there's a lot of a lot of difficult things. And like um, Jess had said, it's something that's um, it, it, it's a difficult thing. It's kept me up. Um, I wish we had more information, more clarity on what you had outlined, Kevin. Um, more clarity on what our other uh, government colleagues um, can bring to bear to be helpful. Um, yeah. Before I go to public comment, is there anything else from the board? Yeah, I, um, I might want to just ask Claudio and Judy to comment on this. I mean, the bond covenant, uh, as I understand, your the target ratio is uh, 1.4 and you're at 1.7 plus or minus now. And that uh, that delta between the 1.7 and 1.4 is, uh, in my rough calculations, about one and a half million dollars. And that is in the ballpark of a one to two percent increase in rate. Um, but let's just, and, and just the, the reason I cited the volatility in your non-operating revenue is uh, that is a negative $12 million swing since uh, the 2022 budget was passed from a plus 5.5 million to a negative 6.7 million. So that is a lot of volatility. I mean, just in the non-operating revenue, there was a, over this period of time since the original budget was passed, there's been a $12 million swing. 
So 1.5 million is not out of the question. You know, it's not an extreme measure. But let's talk about the consequence to the hospital if you breach that bond covenant. What what un, what unfolds from that? So we go into technical default, and then we work with um, our partners, the USDA and TD Bank, who hold notes uh, of our debt. Um, and we work through a process uh, that they will prescribe for us. So could that result in the hospital having to pay ha having to pay a higher rate on their debt? So we do have a portion of debt that rolls over um, in 2023. Uh, we've we've got uh, some swaps outstanding. Um, all of these decisions affect our strength going into those negotiations. Thank you. If, if, if I may add to that, um, Member Pelham and members of the board, there's <clears throat> something that's in our mind um, just as bad or worse than us going into default of our bond covenant. And I appreciate your understanding and concern about that. But for us, when you talk about you know holding hospitals accountable or sticking to a budget, we can do that. Uh, in the face of these unprecedented cost increases that we didn't create, we, we have to react to. The challenge is for us to stick to our budget, the, what we're trying to avoid for our communities and those we serve is something has to give. Uh, and why we came to you with this unprecedented request mid-year, we don't want to be here. A lot of, believe me, I don't want to be here right now doing this. And I didn't want to go to our board of business people, a lot, a lot of folks that pay these. Um, but the reason that we did this is we don't want to have to reduce services. And the reason we went mid-year is we can't wait until mid-September to hear your final decision on what ends up in our budget to make some of those adjustments. We will be forced to respond and react, to be prudent, to try to fend off bond covenants and all those other things sooner rather than later. Because there's some, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort to do that. And that's what we're trying to avoid. And I'm not saying this to be alarmist or scary. I'm just saying this to be realistic. Um, uh, and once having, having served my entire 30 plus year career in rural health care in Vermont and in Maine and Illinois, I seen, I've seen firsthand, once you reduce, especially in a rural area like we are, in, in an underserved and a, a socioeconomically challenged area, once you reduce or eliminate some of those services um, with some of these pressures, it is almost impossible to, to get those back. That's what we're fighting against, and that's what we're asking your help for. We don't want to be in that position. Um, and it's not because we're asleep at the wheel. It's These costs are real. You recognize them. I understand you're in a tough position, but so are we. And, and we don't want to um, we think that pain is worse than some of the other things. Well, that's our that's our position in, in this. But Claudio, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. We we share a, a desire to serve Vermonters, right? And um, I don't want to see service lines closed anywhere. Um, on the on the other end of the spectrum though looking at individuals we know the research is quite clear we probably have family members faced with even a $25 increase in their out of pocket ex expense they don't go to a service line that's open they don't get their medicine and and so it'd be terrible for a service line to close but increased out of pocket expenses stop people from going they ration their own care and so trying to balance this is a very difficult thing. And we, we share a desire to serve Vermonters. And I, I 
I appreciate you bringing that up. So if I if I could just add, there's been a lot of um, focus on using reserves to fund inflation. Um, and we have done that in Rutland. All of those one-time costs have been funded out of our cash reserves. We made that commitment when we made that decision and, and we certainly followed through on that. But reserves are also uh, used for things that we're all passionate about, we're all committed, and that's moving from fee-for-service. And the only reserves that hospitals have are their cash to migrate into those fee-for-service or those value-based programs. I will tell you, we're trying to, you know, make our way in Rutland. Uh, when we look at our Medicaid utilization this year, if we were not in value-based care, we'd be about a million dollars above where we are right now. We're, we're, we are getting paid less for our Medicaid utilization in value-based care than we would fee-for-service. Uh, the other piece that we're all worried about is where are the risk corridors going next year? You know, they have been limited. They have been controlled by the good work of you, this board, One Care. Um, but we are looking at, um, you know, significant increases in those risk, risk thresholds and corridors. The only reserves we have are our cash to make that transition. And so I would ask you to think about the cash on balance sheets a bit more different, uh, uh, broadly, I guess I would say, than just supporting inflation. They're really there to support our transition in this commitment that we have uh, as, as a state of Vermont, as healthcare providers, to move deeper into this value-based you know, payment structure. And before I go to public comment, I just want to say, uh, Claudio and Judy, that I do think that you're one of the better run hospitals that I've seen, that uh, I appreciate everything that you've done throughout the pandemic and even before. Um, and I don't believe that any hospital should be in, this, in a position where um, they have to operate at a negative margin. If there is no margin, there is no mission. The problem that we have here is timing and when's the appropriate time. And I realize um, in my brain, I'm thinking as a former business owner, you know, do you have that uh, harsh impact all at once, which would be in the normal budget process, or do you have it phased in? Um, anybody that thinks that uh, um, this pressure on the workforce is going to go away um, anytime soon is mistaken. It's going to take years for us to do what we should have been doing um, a number of years ago. And we knew that there were bottlenecks. We knew that um, qualified Vermonters who want to become nurses were being not accepted at programs due to um, some real discrepancies in um, the pay for faculty. And even more importantly, as we're talking with hospitals, the lack of uh, sufficient um, clinical experience and precepting. So, you know, I don't know what the right answer is here. And that's what makes this decision even more troubling. Oftentimes things are very black and white. I think there's a lot of gray here. And, um, with that, I'll open it up to public comment. Does any member of the public wish to speak at this time? And I'll start with the healthcare advocate, Sam. Thanks so much, Chair Mullen. Sam Pysh, Health Policy Analyst, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. So the HCA, we submitted written comments, but I'll just briefly summarize them here. We recognize the current financial position of RRMC is partly a reflection of critical investments made in their healthcare workforce, which we support, that are related to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. RMC asked the GMCB to make the assumption that rejecting third charge requests will inevitably result in deep cuts to medical service lines. This may be. However, this argument is difficult to accept, absent any meaningful discussion or alternative contingency plans from the hospital as to why this is the case. 
There are other mechanisms to raise revenue and or cut costs or use reserves. We therefore urge the Green Mountain Care Board to reject the mid-year charge increase requests for Rutland in the interest of short-term and long-term consumer affordability, health insurance market stability, and working towards short and longer-term state health reform goals, particularly as we consider global budgets. We also share board member concerns about gauging in this type of mid-year process as we move into the annual hospital budget process. We can hold two truths at the same time. We can both commend Rutland for their heroic work under, done during the pandemic, as well as investments in their workforce, and recognize that charge requests, particularly at the level requested, are unsustainable for the state, both in the short term and the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Are there other members of the public who wish to speak at this time? Are there other members of the public who wish to offer public comment at this time? Hearing none, board members, does anyone wish to make a motion? No takers. <laughs> Shall I do my usual? Um, Thank you, Robin. Sure. Um, uh, you know, I'll just say this is a really tough decision. So I think the motion that I, the motion I will make reflects where I am. Um, and I, I do want to say that I agree with you, Kevin, that Claudio and Judy are terrific and they've done heroic jobs. And I certainly appreciate the tough spot that they're in right now. Uh, but I'm going to move to deny the rate increase. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none and not sure what the outcome of the vote will be, I'll ask um, Russ McCracken to call the roll. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I will call the roll in alphabetical order. Uh, Member Holmes? Yes. Member Lunch? Yes. Uh, Chair Mullen? Yes. Member Pelham? No. Uh, Member Walsh? Yes. Let the record show that it was a four to one vote uh, denying the request. Kim, I want to thank you, and uh, I understand Joanne will be with us at one o'clock this afternoon. That's correct. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. And at this Have point in time, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Patrick Rooney to um, discuss uh, guidance for fiscal year 23. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you see my screen? We can. Great, thank you. Before we get started, I, I do want to do some follow up with the board on <clears throat> uh, what we just heard. Um, the mid year budget cycle uh, that we go through when requested is not as formidable as the uh, the true budget process. And because of that and some of the circumstances surrounding the current healthcare environment, we've had to kind of pivot quickly and think on our feet and provide perspectives that uh, we probably wouldn't normally provide in that mid-year request. So I'd like to know if the inflation exercise that we went through today and the comparative peer analysis was helpful to the board, uh, because if it was, uh, I'm sure there are folks from the UVM Health Network on uh, listening to that <coughs> um, discussion today that we should seek signal that they can expect uh, a similar request as we move towards a discussion on theirs as well, because we have the two hospitals from the network. So um, if You're that speaking as one board member, Patrick, I would say I believe it's it was helpful. OK. 
I agree. Very much so. Same here. Also agree. I think you have Very five good. of them. <laughs> All right, thank you. We will make sure that we prepare a similar analysis for the University of Vermont Medical Center and Central Vermont. Okay, <clears throat> transitioning now to uh, the guidance. Um, before I start, however, I do want to take this time because we can uh, sometimes wrap up our business relatively quickly, uh, but I wanted to make sure I took the opportunity to thank uh, the team that was involved in bringing this uh, to this point today. Uh, and it's my hope that we can land this thing and begin to move on to other works. But I want to say specifically a huge thank you to the finance team, uh, Lori, Matt, and Flora for their work on this. Uh, Russ McCracken, our staff attorney, who for better or worse gets embedded with us every time we go through this business. Um, he's been exceptional as always. Uh, and some of the members of our extended team this year, Sarah Lindberger, Jeff Batista from the analytics team, Michelle Sawyer from the ACO team, Michelle Degree, uh, who have helped us really round this thing out. And uh, kind of one of the unsung heroes, uh, our administrative assistant, Cara Kreis, who has kept this uh, activity moving forward um, and keeps that transparent component alive by getting these documents to the internet for consumption by the public. So I wanted to take that, that brief moment there to thank everyone for their work. It's been a very busy month uh, and everyone has taken the time and paid the attention to make sure that we can deliver on behalf of the board. So I wanted to extend my thank you to everyone. And with that, uh, we will move into the discussion here this morning. Uh, it is March 30th. This is the third iteration of our discussion uh, in the last three weeks about the 2023 hospital budget guidance. Uh, we are hoping to attain a vote here today of approval for that guidance, uh, which as you can see on the screen, uh, next steps would be submissions of the hospital budgets uh, on July 1st. And we are due to, if approved today, we are due to deliver this guidance and supporting documents to the hospitals by tomorrow, March 31st. <clears throat> uh, to date here, um, public comment received uh, on behalf of Boz. They did submit another one late yesterday after we had already uh, published this slide deck. Um, <clears throat> And also, uh, I want to include the HCA in this uh, because some of their uh, comments that they provided uh, last week were also uh, public comments that were uh, built into their uh, questions and contributions for this cycle as well. So a recap, uh, as of March uh, 23rd last week, these are the changes that we had proposed to the board last week. I'm not going to go through each one of these um, <clears throat> on the hospital guidance uh, and dependencies. So, um, well, wait a second here. I opened the wrong document. I'll be right back. This is not updated. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting concerned there. Um, <clears throat> okay. OK, that's embarrassing. I was wondering why I wasn't seeing the HCA uh, recognition of their uh, public comments and additional questions. So I apologize. Um, here we go. Um, <clears throat> again, as of last week, some of the changes that we made uh, and presented to the board, uh, and this has been a process where we've provided you with the changes and then stepped up to discuss uh, the changes that we've made in the interim. So these were as of last week. Um, here we are with the uh, guidance policies. Um, there's really no changes here. Uh, Russ had addressed the uh, HCA's uh, contribution to this policy in addition. Uh, that was uh, made as of last week, uh, so their request has been added to that, uh, but that was a change that was already in discussion. Uh, so some of the changes from last week uh, where there was a request to add to uh, section 3B2, <clears throat> I will scroll to that. Here we are, um, highlighted in green here uh, to add uh, occupancy rate per staff bed and occupancy rate 
uh, for licensed bed. So we've added that component in here as well. Uh, section 3D3 on wait times uh, and add to have uh, hospitals discuss and outline the steps to resolve some of the wait times that they've been hearing. So uh, a minor narrative component asking the hospitals to uh, provide some forward thinking and planning around how they expect to resolve some of those wait times. <clears throat> Section 3E, risks and opportunities. Uh, there was a request to provide uh, some information for benchmarking around salaries per FTE, FTEs per adjusted occupied bed and salary expense to NPR. Um, so we've gone ahead and added that, as you can see here. Uh, in the supplemental data monitoring section, uh, we added language, and I apologize for uh, the lack of highlight here, so I'll do it up on the screen. Um, board member Lunge had asked last week if uh, the HCA's uh, request around Medicare reimbursement ratios was redundant to some of the work that uh, was being put forth in the supplemental data monitoring component. And so we met with the HCA uh, and reached a very quick conclusion uh, on behalf of uh, Jeff Batista from our analytics team that in fact we could provide the HCA with the information uh, from the data that our analytics team is going to compile for this process. And so we added language that would outline how it was going to be broken down and that uh, our analytics team would be able to provide uh, those tables to uh, the HCA uh, for use in uh, their analysis. So we wanted to highlight that um, that has been eliminated. The HCA uh, agreed with uh, Jeff's assessment. And so uh, we've been able to eliminate that potential additional request, but we wanted to call out some of the language here um, that captures uh, what the HCA was looking for. So we made a specific point to add that here. Um, the only other component uh, that we have to add is that the HCA questions were updated to res uh, as a result of that. Um, <clears throat> they, we did agree that the uh, request the question around uh, contingency for uh, change in charge or lack of receipt of the charge that they request should remain as a written question. Uh, so the only uh, items that were removed from the HCA's previous submission was that uh, Medicare reimbursement ratio component. The rest of it remains intact uh, and everybody should have received a copy of those updated questions uh, and those are also posted to our web page. <clears throat> So the big discussion is going to be around uh, net patient revenue and what that figure uh, should be. And so we look back at how we approached some of this work last year and ultimately and similarly, it came down to providing some options for the board to consider. And so we wanted to walk through some of those uh, that have been uh, directly discussed or some items that have been alluded to as we've gone through this process. And so one of the more notable options here is that there be no NPR guidance. Uh, and the rationale is that the healthcare landscape is too volatile to set some specific NPR guidance in this budget process. Uh, however, uh, board member Lunge was also curious about if, if that is going to be one of the uh, options for consideration that there be uh, additional components by which the board can attempt to assess and measure that growth. So while uh, the board may not seek an NPR guidance this year, uh, it shouldn't just be blanket, no guidance, and there's no capacity to measure the request. So uh, we worked with our analytics and our legal team to outline some of these and also board member lunch. Uh, and so identifying metrics to assess the components of NPR from a patient hospital perspective for affordability and reasonableness is the core of what some of these metrics seek to capture uh, in lieu of NPR guidance growth. So the indices of price and cost inflation that affect hospitals, provider price index, consumer price index for medical services, measures of consumer affordability, wage growth, CPI for all urban consumers, personal consumption expenditures, Ability to achieve state reform goals, compounding annual growth rate in all pair and model of care from 2017, less than or equal to 4.3%. Population or demographic data, 
hospital variation cost and reimbursement and data relative to payments to similar hospitals. So several of these are already built into the guidance and would further support, uh, in theory, the no uh, explicit um, outline of NPR guidance for fiscal year 2022. So that's option number one. Oops. Option number two. Uh, was proposed by board member Pelham, a two year aggregate guidance of 9%. And the rationale there is the two year approach would provide flexibility for growth in fiscal year 23 and 24. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it considers the personal income growth outlined in the economic review and revenue forecast update for the state of Vermont that was put out in January. And so I believe those numbers were uh, 4.7 and 4.6% as outlined in that report for. 2023 and 2024. So 9% would be right around uh, what is being projected for personal income growth. Again, factoring that affordability component. Option three, uh, and this is one that's been floated out there, uh, but hasn't been directly discussed, uh, but we thought it was prudent to put in here, is the continued alignment with the all pair model total cost of care growth. Uh, of not more than 4.3% in 2023. And the rationale there is that it keeps hospital growth in line with the average growth outlined in the five-year APM agreement. The range there is 3.5 to 4.3, going at the higher end to, you know, again, capture some of those uh, circumstances that exist in the healthcare landscape, but still maintaining that uh, linkage to the all pair model and healthcare reform efforts. And option four, is a hybrid of two and three with an aggregated two year approach of not more than 8.6%. So it would be two consecutive years of all payer model total cost of care growth at the high end of 4.3% for 23 and 24. And again, the rationale there would provides flexibility for growth in 23 and 24. That is not explicit to 4.3%. So it carries with it that option number two component of should a hospital feel that they need to grow 6%, then that still gives them some flexibility in the prior year as things begin to normalize again. So it's also still tied to the all pair model agreement, and it still considers the economic review and revenue forecast update for the state of Vermont as it relates to personal income growth. And so again, tying it back to that affordability component that the board always seeks to consider. So, a small update to the staff recommendation. Uh, we do still feel that the board uh, should establish some sort of NPR growth ceiling based on uh, the majority of the options just presented. We are pulling back on our original um, consumer and producer price figure that we originally discussed. The, uh, the discussion has evolved since the early stages and there's no appetite for that approach. So we want to focus on the options that have been provided on the previous slide. So so that this does not serve as a distraction, we have cut that from staff recommendation. However, the other recommendations still stand. <clears throat> and that includes at the very bottom here, um, all of the adjustments and also that we recommend you accept uh, the updated HCA questions. Uh, from the healthcare advocate as part of this process. And so the couple of items that uh, you would need to vote on today are the NPR FPP growth guidance, whether or not you set a limit, uh, we need to establish uh, the board's perspective on that, and also the overall acceptance of the budget guidance. So we have motion language for uh, both of those topics. And should we be able to reach that conclusion today? Uh, that concludes the presentation, taking us to July 1st for submission of budget materials uh, by the state's 14 uh, community hospitals. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you and your fellow board members for discussion. Thank you, Patrick. And not to uh, be overhanded with my fellow board members, but if we don't reach conclusion today, we will be meeting again tomorrow morning at 730 because we have the obligation to have this set settled by the end of this month, and we will meet that obligation. So I'm hopeful that uh, we can settle this today and uh, move forward. Um, I'll start the discussion off by saying that uh, I favor option one, that uh, I don't think that the other options necessarily um, work 
we just made a, a very tough decision to deny a rate request. But in denying that, I hope that we sent a clear message that this board is going to be receptive to understanding the pressures that um, hospitals are seeing in the normal budget process. And we can't turn our heads on the fact that the cost of nursing and other provider um, pay is not going to magically just stop. And we have to be prepared for some, some significant increases in the, the upcoming budget season to reflect that. If not, we're going to put hospitals on a death spiral as they chew through all existing reserves or they start making the unconscionable decisions to start to shut down uh, uh, units. And that brings up the topic um, that wasn't discussed on the slides, but I think bears discussing. We, re we received a letter from Vaz asking for a few things. And I just want to say that one of the things that I'm not prepared to um, cut out of guidance is the information on wait times. To me, we have the a triple mission, and that triple mission is very clear. It's in our mission statement and everywhere else that it's about controlling cost, it's about access for Vermonters, and it's about quality of care. And to me, the most uh, important of those is making sure that Vermonters have access to care. And I think that we are in a situation here where some Vermonters are not receiving timely care, and I think we need to continue to collect that information. And I agree with some of the points that Vaz has made that this may not be the most perfect um, solution that has been proposed, but I want to ask our staff attorney, Russ McCracken, if we vote on this and there was continuing dialogue on um, a better, um, uh, better measurement of wait times, could this be amended at a future point in time? And the reason why I ask that is the affected parties that would be doing the work would be the hospitals. And if it was amended, it's because they made a case why there's a better way of doing wait times. So um, that's why I asked the question, Russ. Under the board's hospital budget rule, the guidance is supposed to be issued by March 31st. It doesn't talk about amendments to the, the guidance. Um, I think that if there was an amendment that was supported by the hospitals who are submitting the budgets and also by the board, um, then, you know, I mean, I'm inclined to say that the board could could do that. Thank you, Russ. Um, those were really my comments on uh, where we're at. Um, other board members? Sure, I'll go. Um, I support option one as well, uh, and I appreciate all of the additional references to the data that we would use to assess um, the reasonableness of, of the budget submissions. Um, the emphasis, you know, I would emphasize that my focus will be on a comparison of the budget requests to the actual experiences and fiscal years 19 through projected 22. Um, and using that data, we can, we can, you know, rely on evidence-based reasonableness of the pricing and utilization assumptions in the submitted budget. So, uh, I support option number one, um, and like Kevin, I don't support dropping the wait time information. Uh, as Kevin referenced, access to care is critical to improving our population's health. And given the really long wait times revealed in the state's report, we need to do better as a state on improving access. And the first step to improving access is monitoring wait times in a consistent and standard way. And so I would support keeping the wait times as is. And um, to the degree that we learn along the way that, you know, there may be some better ways this is a learning process, but I don't think kicking the can down the road uh, is the appropriate step here. So I think that uh, I would support the wait time data collection efforts that are uh, in the budget guidance as written. 
that's all I have. Thanks, Jess. Other board members? This is uh, Tom. Tom, Tom Walsh. Um, I also support uh, continuing to uh, monitor wait times as discussed. Um, my experience in uh, other organizations is there's no one measure of wait times that everybody agrees is um, sound and fit for everyone. It takes uh, multiple measures to include um, the views from all stakeholders vantage points. Um, there's, I am not familiar with one measure that um, satisfies everyone, so we'll, uh, we'll need to um, come to terms with that. I think it's an important thing to keep monitoring because like Kevin said, um, I think access is a key thing. Um, and as I mentioned earlier in this meeting, access is not only a function of, is there a place to go, but it's also a function of, is it affordable to go? Is it affordable to go there? Um, and so I think um, guidance regarding NPR growth is important. Um, and I think looking at our existing agreements um, is also important. That's why I favor option four. Um, I think the upper limit of our existing agreements um, provides over a two year period, the 4.3 per year over a two year period at 8.6 affords a lot of flexibility. Right? An organization could, in, could request a 7% increase in year one and a 2.3 the next to, to help weather some of our, some of the concerns people are facing. Um, I'm, I'm comforted too by the work the st staff has done bringing in the forecasted growth in state GDP and personal income. Uh, that 8.3, 8.6 over two years is nicely aligned with the 9% um, projected growth in GDP and personal income. Uh, that gives me some reassurance on the affordability front. Um, so I'm in, I'm landing on option four at the moment. Thank you, Tom. Other board members? Yeah, I'll step in here. Um, I, I uh, having been the author of option number two, I would totally con um, fully concede that option number four is a pretty close call and I uh, I can land or uh, you know, I, I, I think I'm landing around option four um, as well. I'm I'm I, I think what it does is give it, it does put a lid on our you know, on our expectations for revenue growth and cost growth, but at the same time spreads it over a two year period um, and allows hospitals to take that cumulative amount and 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 work with it. I mean, we might have some hospitals out there that um, haven't been as badly treated, um, you know, um, by the, the COVID in situation and are, are doing quite well and might want uh, a, a two or three percent uh, in year one, and a uh, the, the remaining amount in year two. Um, so it it still has constraint, but it has flexibility. And um, as the note at the bottom of option one says, we live in a volatile environment. Um, this does give some order to it. Um, relative to option one, I'm just concerned that. You know, here we are an entity um, pursuing health care reform that talks a lot about capitation and fixed perspective payments and global budgeting kind of uh, containment vessels for health care uh, expenditures. And at the same time, we we have a, a, a budget process for hospitals, you know, that doesn't set a target. And I fear that at least I fear that I kind of have a feeling for what we would get with this process. Uh, it takes me back to um, Dr. Brumstead when uh, in his appeal, I think, to the 2021 budget, where basically was pegging um, uh, the argument to uh, very uh, to, to in, in medical inflation amounts. And as we can see in the um, you know the current application. Uh, where uh, things are being tied to inflation rates that are nine or ten percent a year, um, I worry that we're going to get um, from hospitals 
uh, a wish list in terms of a response to a budget process as opposed to a uh, a, a reasonable budget process that is um, um, you know that 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 is uh, as as Tom as the other Tom was saying kind of balanced and integrated with what's actually going on on the street in Vermont, you know, in the, in the homes of Vermonters. Um, I, I think we have to do everything we can to live in, the, in that three and a half to four and a half percent world uh, and do it in a reasonable way. But uh, to take kind of an, an a, uh, un, uh, you know, a, a, an approach that, uh, that, that basically doesn't give some fiscal guidance and discipline to the process uh, is um, a, a potential recipe. It could work out fine, um, um, but it's a p potential recipe for not working out fine. Um, I do think that the metrics that are there are helpful, and, and whether it's option four, option one, those metrics are are helpful. But uh, I, 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 I think I think we need some discipline in the process from the get go, and so I would land on option four. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Robin, did you want to offer any comments before I go to public comment? Sure. Um, this is a tough one. I, for me, I, I recognize what you, Kevin, and Jess are saying related to the volatility and that picking a target this year. Uh, we could be picking a target that is unrealistic and that we won't stick to. I think you know you we could see that last year in our in our process. We because again of the uncertainty and the volatility, we kind of stuck with the target that we had been going with. Um, and, but then approved budgets that were above that to recognize the circumstances of the hospitals and the current status of COVID. Um, but I think even so, I think I would, where I'm landing is I would prefer to pick a target and then if that target turns out to not be realistic given the circumstances on the ground, you know, I think we've shown openness to being realistic about that regardless of the target that we set. Um, but given that, in my mind, the purpose of having a target is to to really signal a longer term uh, commitment, um, I think I'm landing on uh, having a target. Um, in terms of what target, <laughs> I appreciate the options because I think they do give us um, a range to work within. Um, and in thinking about a one year versus two year, uh, I look back at um, earlier in the pandemic when we attempted to do a two year target with this idea that hospitals could kind of balance it over two years. Um, I thought that was a good effort and a good idea. Although in reality, I think we didn't especially stick with that in the end, uh, the second year. Again, we were in the middle of a pandemic, circumstances had changed from where we had hoped they would be when we approved that. So I do think there's some risk there with the two-year target is that we're just setting ourselves up to not follow it <laughs> also. <laughs> um, but with that said, I'm willing to give it another shot, I think. so. Um, I'm talking myself around to option four. Okay, before I open it up to public comment, does any board member wish to offer any more comments? I actually just have a question for those of you in support of option four. Um, for that to work, the expectation would be that hospitals are planning over a two year period. Um, and so I'm wondering if you're also then asking for a two year budget submission or just a one year budget submission. And then in the following year, the idea would be the board would hold them to uh, the two year target. Well, my, this uh, to the legal question on um, the, the statutory language is an annual budget. So again, I'll go to legal for a discussion on that. Um, it has to be a one year 
budget submission and the board will establish annually the budgets for the hospitals. Uh, so it's the, the, the target is aggregating two one year submissions. And I'll just say for me, it is consistent with my sort of conceptual idea of a target as setting a longer term kind of vision. So recognizing that we still need to make the decision each year, the hospitals still need to submit each year, um, just gives a little bit more of an idea of where I'm hoping we will stick in the next two years. Agreed. I, I, that's that has been my understanding um, that it would be a, a yearly budget submission and approval. Um, but having a long ra longer range plan in mind, I think is wise and having uh, being out front about it and allowing the flexibility um, in planning. They may an organization may submit a one year, but if they are, are aware of what we're thinking about the two year period, I think it's more flexible. OK, um, unless a board member has further comment, I'm going to open it up to the public for comment. And does any member of the public wish to comment at this time? And I'm going to call on Jeff Tiemann first. Great, good morning. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Um, so I, I just want to start by um, thanking the board for reviewing our, our two letters that we, we submitted for the record in public comment which I think suggested fairly minor adjustments to simplify the guidance and and with regard to wait times um, to look at that in a careful and collaborative way. Um, you know, in fact, yesterday's letter following some feedback we heard just this week from our chief medical officers was a suggestion from me and, and the group I represent to, to sit down and do this together. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a little puzzled as to why that offer would just kind of be roundly rejected. I, it should be really clear that we were not trying to get out of reporting wait times or managing this issue or looking at it. And in fact, if you heard me speak um, along with many of our members at a press conference we hosted on this issue last month, we openly and readily acknowledged the need to look at wait times and the importance of doing so in order for Vermonters to get the care they need when and where they need it. Um, and, and then just yesterday in the letter kind of, you know, repeated that in, in a kind offer, I think, to work together on this instead of rush into uh, a new data mandate. So I, I just have to say it's a little disappointing to, that the board doesn't appear to be hearing us on that. And instead, moving forward with a, a new mandate when we could spend even a small amount of time talking with chief medical officers and data experts and wait times experts and others to measure this in a way that's productive for Vermonters and hospitals alike, but not burdensome or, or wasteful or punitive or, or ultimately unhelpful. Um, for example, different hospitals have different abilities to collect this information in a consistent way, and that could use some further discussion, um, which again, we're willing to engage in, And I, as I said in the letter. Also, to, to echo some of the feedback we heard from chief medical officers, um, the, we have not heard a way to manage the issue of adjusting the data collection for severity of illness or urgency of appointments, which is a really important point. Another important one is that wait times are a single metric. Outcomes are another and perhaps an even more important one. And as all of you know well, Vermont consistently scores highly on outcomes relative to other states regionally and nationally. So again, just plenty more reason to be thoughtful and careful and take even a small amount of time here to look at these issues together and a little more carefully before rushing into a new mandate. We also know that DFR, uh, the Department of Financial Regulation, is going before Senate Health and Welfare on this issue, I think, tomorrow, and don't know what that might result. Um, don't know where that might go, and I worry about yet another or possibly a duplicative or even conflicting mandate. Um, finally, it's it's also disappointing not to be heard here for another reason, um, which is that this board, I think, has kindly um, many times paid lip service to thanking hospitals for their service and their contribution 
throughout the pandemic and acknowledging the workforce challenge we faced during and, and, and now in the phase that we're in, but then not really acting in accordance with those thoughts to streamline the guidance or, or limit new mandates, especially ones that could clearly use some further thought and consideration. So again, we fully support the notion and the importance of looking at this data. It's important for Vermonters, it's important to hospitals, which are mission-based organizations. Um, and I think that um, would we'll just repeat my request that we do that instead of rushing a new mandate into the guidance, which has already not, which has already been significantly expanded. And I think Mike might comment on that, but has not been streamlined or simplified or, um, or diminished in any way. And then lastly, just to make one point from a previous discussion, I, I would not want to speak for the Agency of Human Services on this, but the only federal or state money I'm aware of to support ongoing workforce challenges, um, first of all, has to be totally COVID related, not just workforce related, but literally related to treating COVID patients um, and staffing shortages related to that. Um, and even those dollars, as I understand it, and any supported opportunities are already completely exhausted. So I will stop there and thank the board as always for hearing our comments. Thank you, Jeff. And I'll just repeat what I said earlier that I think that we did listen to what you said in, in your letter. Um, I, I, I don't want to get into a back and forth here, but I agree with you that um, the, the conversation has to continue on the proper way to um, measure wait times. And that's why I asked the question of legal on whether or not if um, we could come up with an agreement with you in further conversations that we could, um, you know, go back to the in, in uh, change this guidance. The rule says that we have to adopt this guidance um, by March 31st, and we're going to meet that rule and we're not going to leave it empty so that something could fall apart and nothing would be um, accessed. I agree with you that DFR is in the legislature. But the, the timing of when they will have that information um, is in the future. And this is a real problem today. And that's why I feel it's important that uh, we have language in here. But Jeff, I'm willing to work with you to um, come up with what's even better language if you know we can start that process and uh, make that happen. So that's my well, commitment to you. Well, so thank you, Kevin. I, 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 not being an expert on what's possible in terms of changing language, I would, I would just say that if there is any opportunity as we move forward to identify better or more streamlined ways to do that, we certainly welcome that conversation. Thanks. As would the board. Thank you, Jeff. Next, I'm going to go to Dean French. Uh, Chairman, if it's okay, I, I'll defer to Mike Del Treco. Certainly, Mike. Sure. Uh, first of all, um, thanks for all the work that's going on here today. Um, my comments are uh, a little difficult to come by this morning. I'm I'm slightly perplexed in this year's process. Uh, we've we've had um, two years where where we focused on streamlining efforts to um, really focus on those items that uh, impact. Uh, hospital budget decision making. Uh, there are two items that in our last comment around ACO data collection and around the supplemental data requests that that may or may not apply to all hospitals to ask all hospitals to answer questions around market share demographics and or variation that they that 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 is difficult to come by for them is uh, an interesting new um, new request. So um, this is kind of how this year worked. Um, the board met, the board added new items based on the conversation. Uh, Vaz commented, uh, you certainly discussed some of those things, but um, very little or no action was taken, and maybe that's intentional. Um, but I'd love to understand um, sort of some of that logic, because um, we spent a lot of time sort of analyzing understanding the guidance. We spent a lot of time with our hospital 
groups from CMOs, CNOs to CFOs uh, on what works, what doesn't work, how to really make sure that we uh, are good stewards of uh, Vermonters resources um, and all of the things that we all um, uh, talk about. Um, so I'm, I, that's why I open with I'm a little perplexed, but uh, I'll stop there and and, uh, and and hear your comments. Thank you. So my comments would be quite simply, Mike, that uh, um, the status quo is not working, that we recognize that, and we can't just allow um, for um, unsustainable um, movement to occur, and that the, the board is willing to um, work with you to come up with um, the best measurements of uh, wait times. But when it comes to um, wait times, we take it very seriously. And when it comes to healthcare reform efforts, we take it seriously. And that's why the ACO um, information is um, is there. And you know, we're at a point in time where we are trying to um, figure out what's next in in our um, negotiations with Washington and where we go as a state. And so it's imperative that uh, that information uh, be available to the board. And I don't think it's too much to ask. Um, yeah, so, turn. so uh, you know, just just to just to comment, um, I don't think we're for the status quo either, and I agree with that uh, completely. So, um, I I uh, I think in order for any project or process to move forward. If we're going to do it with the same financing, uh, we will have uh, large problems on our hands. Um, I think one of the challenges that I see when I look and listen to these conversations is an inflationary target that's pegged to state growth. Our state growth is flat and stagnant. We have an economic crisis um, and that we shouldn't tie uh, the Vermont hospital growth rate to. So. I agree with all of the reform conversations. I agree with outcomes. I agree with understanding uh, information. Um, but I don't understand how uh, decisions are made. It's not clear how all of these decisions impact hospital budget, uh, uh, hospital budgets going forward. And I'll, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Next, I'll turn to Ham Davis. Kim Davis, are you there? If you're speaking, you're on mute. I'm sorry, Kevin, can you hear me now? We can. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, there's really two questions here. One is the one is which option you want on the uh, on the uh, the uh, NPR kind of caps, and the second one is on the the wait times. On the on the caps, I, I can't see any connection to reality to this discussion. The if you look at the system and it's been doing this for 15 years, uh, the the uh, the problem at the UVM MC is 50 percent of the pro of the whole system, and it is its huge problem is that it can't process all of the, the traffic that it's going to get. So. Whatever, whatever in whatever cap you put on there, has got nothing to do. They're going to just have to get all the more, all the. They're going to have to get people through there faster, not slower. It does, so that that question. So for 50 50 percent of the system, the the option one is the only one that that means anything. Although even that doesn't mean mean many much mean very much because uh, the the real cost, the co the connection to cost. Uh, as far as volume is concerned, is basically captured in the commercial ask. Um, so I, I think you know you you can you can put in option one, two, three, or four. You can add them together. You can have all the options. What UEM will do is they will get people through their place as fast as they can, and it probably won't be fast enough. And the faster they get it through, the more money they're going to it's going to cost. That that just seems to me obvious. If we get to the question of on the, on the other hand, in the smaller hospital, we've got a majority of this state you know, critical access hospitals. Those hospitals are going to get every patient in the door that they can. 
that, that, that there's no there's no nobody is going to go to a hospital that 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 the the, the uh, critical access hospitals are essentially going to do exactly what UVM is doing. They their problem has been to get enough revenue, not to get enough volume. And so they in order to do that, they're just going to take all the people they can. So you can talk all you want about these these options; they don't mean a thing. Uh, the second thing is on the wait times. The wait times is 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 really really uh, Im important here. But and the, the, it's great that the Green Mountain Care Board is really concerned about that. But it, it's a fantasy to think that the that the that the Green Mountain Care Board can do anything about wait times. The what are you going to do? You can, can can you get more people in there? Can you hire more doctors? You can't do any of that. So as far as I'm concerned, the what we're getting here is a huge amount of unreality. Thank you, Ham. Um, Dean French, I see your hand back up. Is that from earlier, or did you no, miss just something? Yeah, you know, I, I I did have. Um, I appreciate the board's uh, budget guidance. I, just a couple of quick thoughts um, as um, we talk about these things. Um, you know, wait times. Um, I agree with the commentary from Vaz as a member of Vaz and the challenge of measuring it. I think importantly for some of the hospitals in the state, like mine, we have pluralistic medical staffs, meaning a fair number of our medical staff are independent physicians in our health service area. And it's unclear to me when we talk about wait times, whether you're asking me to try to measure the wait times into independent private practices. And, and if you're not, then what are we actually accomplishing? Uh, you know, I have two independent dermatologists in town. I don't employ any. One of the longest wait times in the study that the state did was on dermatology. Um, I have independent surgeons. So it, it feels to me like we're going to go through this exercise of measurement of hospital employed providers, but it doesn't actually give us a full picture of what access to care is across a health service area. And so to me, there should be a pause and a serious conversation about what we're trying to accomplish. And then, and, and I'll, I have one other thing and that's on the options. And I would just say this, the net patient revenue cap for certain markets is challenging when we look at access to care and the need to get people access to specialists in health service areas. I have a aging demographic. I have a growing county in health service area, not a flat county. 20% growth in over the age of 65. I'm in the middle of my community needs assessment right now, and that's going to inform what service lines this facility needs to build out to meet the needs of the community over the next five to 10 years. Net patient revenue caps make it very difficult to thoughtfully plan and invest in service line development to meet the needs of the community. And those investments will help offload the hospital 25 miles to my south for things that could be being managed in a community hospital well and in a high quality way. But this process we go through makes it very difficult to think strategically and thoughtfully about those directions. So I, I think, you know, I liked some of the elements of this conversation because I think we were getting there uh, with the two year discussion. But have that in your mind as we think through these things, because I think part of our problem right now is years of net patient revenue caps that were set, I think, in 2014 or 16 reflect a market reality that existed then and that blocked us into it. And we're not able to be flexible enough to meet the needs of our community. Hence, you know, the ever demanding need for the tertiary medical center to grow while you're having your community hospitals contract. So I'll stop there and I don't know if you have a comment or not. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Dean. Is there any other member of the public who wishes to offer comment at this time? And I see a hand from Mark Stanislaus. Hi, Chair. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, these are more just thoughts to consider um, as we think about how we think about evaluating the 23 budget process. And, you know, I'm probably speaking more from an individual with 25 years plus experience in healthcare and a resident of St. Albans, Vermont, more than an employee of the health network. But I think we need to ground ourselves in reality. And, you know, one of the challenges that 
you know, understanding that you need to pass guidance and, 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 you know, and the board has been, you know, willing to listen to hospitals and their stories, but a challenge for me and all of this guidance and like, I'm not getting into the wait time stuff. I'm just going on my 25 plus years of experience in healthcare is our evaluation is budget to budget um, is really not going to exist in the 23 budget cycle. We are facing a once in a 30 year inflation experience. I don't know what that means for all of us as a group, how we navigate through this, but, but I would just ask the board to have that in their thought process, whatever they decide to do today, a once in a 30 year experience. So I don't know how we put that in context of laying out a two year guidance candidly. Okay, um, but I would say it would be difficult to do that. Understanding that we do need, that we do get another slice of this conversation 12 months down the road. Okay, and and I would put out there um, for some context from this morning's conversation. Once again, I'm relying on my 25 years plus experience, probably 50 plus conversations with rating agencies on how they view hospitals' financial sustainability. Um, given the reality of what we're facing today and, 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 the, and the certainty that the FY22 budget column doesn't really mean much anymore, okay? I think we're gonna be presented with some hospitals coming in with say, how do we deal with financial survival? in this next budget cycle, okay? And so I don't know what that does to wait times. I don't know what that does to two years down the road. But when you think about bond covenants and those and those outside grading scores on truly what your financial sustainability is, I just worry it that you're gonna see hospitals coming in and they're gonna be dealing with financial survival. I think you heard Claudio speak to that, some of the tough decisions and they need the lead time. So I don't know how that gets factors into all this guidance. And it's probably just more future thinking of how we need to think about how we go through the conversations. But I thought that I would just put this out to this group. You know, so the takeaways is we are in a once in a 30 year cycle here. Hopefully it's once in a 30 year cycle and it starts to come back to um, whatever the more normal is. And any comparison to the 22 budget, I'm not sure what that's going to be worth. So um, take that for what it's worth. I realize that you need to pass something. You don't have a difficult job working with today or tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. or 7.30. But the most flexibility that you could put into this guidance to at least give the hospitals, like, I mean, I just can't help but saying, if a hospital is concerned about financial sustainability, I don't know if they care about access wait times right then. You know, I'm not saying it's not important and it's not valuable. And, 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 but so I just think in this cycle, there was a cycle a couple of years ago that the Green Mountain Care Board really streamlined the guidance. Um, so um, that's not any of these options, but it's just, I just don't know how we deal with these unprecedented times going into a budget cycle and then picking whatever this percentage is, um, to be a comparison to a column that really isn't going to face reality, acknowledging that the board has been open to listen to all the conversations and they do balance many other considerations that even aren't in the guidance. So um, there's probably no value of any of my comments to this guidance today. So, so I appreciate your patience. Um, but, you know, these are the realities that I think that we're all going to be facing as we as we look towards with July 1st and the discussions in August. Thank you for your comments, Mark. And uh, I wish I was op as optimistic as you that this really is only a, a quarter century in inflationary spiral, but I see this as uh, even worse than what I lived through in the late 70s, early 80s. And uh, it's uh, very depressing when you think about uh, our most vulnerable citizens that are having to deal with going to the grocery store and 
paying twice as much for their groceries as what they were paying for last year and seeing in one season heating oil double in price and um, I, I worry so much about our seniors who are on fixed incomes and uh, it's a, a bad place that we all have to get through together and, and we will get through it. Um, we have been through these times in history before and we've always come out of them on the other end and let's hope we do the same. Is there other public comment? Kevin, may I just make a comment about the work wait times, uh, some of the topics that came up? Sure. Um, I just wanted to clarify, we are only asking for wait time data for hospital owned practices. Um, we, we're not asking for hospitals to go out and reach out to independent practices in their communities. That data is really important. That's one of the reasons that DFR is gonna be carrying the wait time monitoring going forward. They have capacity and uh, jurisdiction over that through their surprise billing um, you know, authority there. But I just want to say that, you know, workforce has been a, a, a common theme and the pressures of workforce have been a common theme and data on wait times could potentially support some of the requests that hospitals will be making around workforce um, and around adding to workforce to alleviate access problems and wait times. So to, in my mind, it's important to one, understand access um, and, you know, the operational processes and the workforce pressures that are under the hospital's control. Uh, but secondly, I think it can support potentially needed additions to, to hospital teams to alleviate workforce pressure. So that data would be supportive of those requests. That's the relevance to the hospital budget process. Is there any other public comment? Is there any other public comment? If not, I'm going to throw it back to the board. And does any board member wish to make any motion at this time, whether it's a, a single motion or a compound motion. So I had a, a thought about the wait times and my apologies, I did men, mean to talk about that um, before, but I was really trying to figure out where I was landing on the NPR option. So um, I, I'm wondering if, it, if potentially in the section of the, and maybe Patrick, you could go to the wait times language in the guidance. Uh, because certainly to, to your point earlier, Kevin, in, in response to Jeff's comment, I, I was not hearing it as, I was not hearing the discussion as a lack of interest or willingness to work together to figure out what the right collection was, but simply having language in the guidance was necessary given that, um, uh, we have to approve it today or tomorrow. So uh, I wonder if it would make sense, and this is really, I think, a question both for board members' interest in this, but also for Russ in terms of thinking through the rule pieces, to add into as, uh, which could be a lead in or could be after the language that's there, um, that board staff and uh, we'll work with stakeholders, which I would include, um, you know, VAS or individual hospitals and uh, the HCA. We, I don't think we need to be that specific, but we could be um, to refine the wait times metrics considered to um, moving forward and the board reserves the ability to amend the requirements based on the outcome of that discussion, just to include sort of that process that we've been talking about in the guidance itself to signal that piece and add context. I think that is helpful, Robin, and I was, uh, you know, playing with some language in my own mind about how to do that and also to uh, keep in, in line with um, our rule. So, um, Russ, is this type of language appropriate? I think we can I think we can include language along those lines. Um, 
I know that we have the rule that calls for the guidance to be completed by March 31st. Definitely a part of that is to allow hospitals sufficient time with the guidance and the reporting manual to complete their submissions in, in advance of the uh, summer submission date. Um, given that here we're um, certainly working with the hospitals and to address um, hospital concerns, I, I think that uh, language could be included. Okay. Would it be appropriate to take a 15 minute bio break and ask Rusk and, and Robin to uh, work on uh, some language? Anybody object to that? Okay, I'm going to put the meeting in recess to 1140, uh, excuse me, 1045, and uh, we'll resume at 1045. Kara, if you could put a, a note up on the screen, letting everyone know that the meeting will resume at 1045. Thank you. And Russ, um, why don't you give me a call? Yeah, I'll give you a call in uh, two minutes, if that's all right. Yes, perfect. Thanks. OK, I'm going to call this meeting back to order. It's 1045. And um, Robin, if you could report on the results of your work with Russ. Sure. So uh, what Russ and I came up with that we would suggest is that the Section D wait times would start with the following language. The board staff and up to two board members will establish a working group to include hospitals, VAS, and other interested parties to determine by May 2nd, which is the Monday, 2022, appropriate wait time metrics that hospitals shall submit as part of the fiscal year 23 budget process. If the work group is unable to determine appropriate metrics, the hospitals shall report the following, and then it would go into the existing language. And then after the existing language, there would be a sentence that read, in each case, hospitals shall outline steps to resolve wait times. So I think we'd take out the green and make it its own sentence. So Robin, so, I think that's a, a great start. I would ask for a, a, a friendly uh, um, insertion of language, and you may tell me why it is or isn't appropriate. But um, I noticed that you said, and interested parties, and I was just hopeful that we could um, specifically state DFR since um, they're going to be uh, working on this in the future and it's good to have the continuum on the uh, wait times and presence and also um, the healthcare advocate. Sure. Okay. Is that a motion on your part, Robin? Yes. Is there a second? I'll second it. Discussion from the board. I just wanted to note the the date. So Russ and I thought um, May 2nd because we wanted to give the work group some time to enough time to work through its process. But our concern about pushing it out too far was that then the hospitals wouldn't have enough time to realistically respond to the question. So that was what we were trying to balance with that May 2nd date. Um, and there may be, a, you know, other people may have ideas about whether that's the right balance, and I'm certainly open to hearing that. That was our, our shot. Is there any board member that wishes to offer um, further discussion as it relates to the motion in front of us concerning wait times? If not, Robin, maybe you could read it one more time since my uh, a uh, shorthand is not good. <laughs> sure. The board staff and up to two board members will establish a work group to include hospital, BAS, DFR, the healthcare advocate, and other interested parties to determine by May 2nd, 2022, appropriate met wait time metrics that hospitals shall submit as part of the fiscal year 23 budget process. If the work group is unable to determine appropriate metrics, the hospital shall report the following. Uh, for each hospital owned practiced through the end of uh, the existing language double I. And then 
uh, triple I would be struck and in its place would be in each case, the hospital shall outline steps to resolve wait times. Okay, is there further discussion on that motion? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Board members who have a desire to um, serve on uh, this group, please email me or text me. If uh, I don't get any email or texts for volunteers, then everyone's hand will have be considered raised. Um, so with that, um, Robin, do you have a motion that you wish to make on NPR? Uh, yes, um, but before I get there, can I just um, respond a little bit on the supplemental data and the value-based care language? Mm -hmm. um, so I did appreciate, um, and I apologize I didn't do this earlier, uh, but I did appreciate getting Vaz's suggestions on other components of the guidance. Um, I did want to just respond to the various comments around streamlining. Um, I certainly, I think I was pretty clear in the last couple of years that I supported streamlining the guidance from the pre-pandemic guidance um, because of the pandemic. I think, however, given where we are currently at with the pandemic, we need to start looking forward to how to ensure that the guidance um, again starts to look at issues beyond the financial. I, prior to the pandemic, I think I advocated, uh, as did other board members, it was certainly not just me, to ensure that we were looking at quality, for example, to look at the community needs assessments. And we had had a component there that gave those sorts of context, because certainly, um, the hospitals bring in some of that information sometimes in their narratives so that we are having the community context and the non-financial context when making the financial decisions. And I do think that's an important context without which, um, quite frankly, I think it makes it harder for the hospitals to tell their story. So uh, for me, I it was important to continue our work trying to align across regulatory processes, which is something which our regulated entities across the board have encouraged, including hospitals. And particularly with um, the supplemental data request, you know, I certainly understand that not all hospitals um, may have fully established answers to these questions. But Vaz was supportive of meaningfully engaging in hospital sustainability planning as part of the legislative process, and in fact asked for language in S-285 uh, about meaningful engagement. So similarly, I think the shoe's on both feet here. So certainly we will hold ourselves accountable to meaningfully engage Vaz, and we would expect hospitals to meaningfully engage as well. And to me, the, lang the language around the supplemental data um, is the beginning of that meaningful engagement. I think that information is necessary for us to understand how to move forward with more fixed payments and changes to the regulatory process in the future. And hearing individual hospitals' perspective on that is important, to me at least. So that's why I appreciated, but uh, didn't suggest making that change to that that section. Um, and I think, Kevin, to your point earlier, um, as we move forward with the all pair model, we also need to understand where hospitals are at with value-based care, understanding that they have been dealing with a pandemic. And the answer might be, there's a lot of things that have been put on hold. We're just turning back to it and we're thinking forward about where to go. So I would expect certainly that during the pandemic that has not been top of mind um, and not the work that needed to happen. Uh, but I do think it's important for us to be forward looking. So I just wanted to address sort of my thinking around those two pieces because I do think it's uh, important to share. Thank you very much, Robin. Did you want to make a motion at this point in time? Sure. 
<laughs> so I um, I would move for the fiscal year 2023 hospital budget review process. The board establish a net patient revenue fixed perspective payment growth guidance of up to uh, 4.3% over, e uh, over each hospital's fiscal year 2022 approved budget and a four point up to 4.3% over each hospital's fiscal year 23 budget to provide two-year guidance um, for, for hospitals. And that may not be quite right, so it might be helpful for me to actually That's, go back to options. Could you put options. up the slide with the options yeah. on them? Yeah, sorry. I should ask for that for, first before I attempted to do this on the fly. Okay, so I'm, and actually I may need, what, this might be cleaner if I actually just spend five minutes on the phone with Russ to make sure that I don't screw up this motion language because it's a little bit more complicated than normal. Um, and I apologize I didn't do that before. But, or Russ, if you have a suggestion off the top of your head, that would be helpful. And if you need the five minutes rest, just let me know. <clears throat> um, Robin, maybe let's let's just speak briefly on the phone. All right, we will I, be I think right I have a back. For you. Uh, I'll <laughs> okay. give you a call. I'm going to put the meeting in recess till eleven o'clock. See everybody at eleven. Welcome back, everyone. Do we have Tom Pelham with us? Tom, are you there? I am. Thank you. And Jess, are you there? I am. Great. And I see Robin and Tom W. So, um, Robin, um, do you have a motion at this time? I do. I'll withdraw the previous attempt and move that we, and I'm going to do the easy way here. Adopt uh, option four on slide nine, which establishes an NPRFPP growth of no more than an aggregated 8.6% <coughs> fiscal year 23 and 24. That gives staff the flexibility of making sure that they can wordsmith the guidance document itself. Okay, is there a second? Second. Been seconded by Tom Pelham. Discussion from the board. If not, Russ, if you could call the roll. Uh, great, thank you. I'll call the roll. Uh, Member Holmes? No. Member Lunge? Yes. Member Pelham? Yes. Uh, Member Walsh? Yes. And Chair Mullen? No. The motion carries three to two, and uh, option four will be the NPR. Um, Patrick, are there any other open points of discussion now in either the um, Word documents or the slides? Uh, aside from the board's approval of the overall guidance, I do not believe so. OK, Robin, are you prepared to make a motion at this time? I am. Um, I do think there's one. Uh, I would put it in the realm of typographical fix, which is, uh, Patrick, if you could go to the data, supplemental data section, there's a lead in sentence. Below are the iterations of rec by staff refine as requested that I think should be struck. I think that was um, a <laughs> note from the from the staff. So I think that's just a you know a, a typo fix. So, uh, but I'm Patrick, going. To... Are you going to strongly object to that being stricken? <laughs> <laughs> I am not. But Robin, is it, is it in the market share reimbursement or demographic? report no it's above both so if you look under h oh yeah 
right there. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, we will remove that. <laughs> okay. So uh, for our fiscal year 23 hospital review process, the I move the Green Mountain Care Board approves the hospital budget guidance as presented to and amended by the board by presented by the board staff and amended during uh, this meeting to be effective March 31st, 2022. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion from the board? Yeah, I, I just have would like to make a couple of comments. I think this is probably the quick place to do it. Um, I had I, I kind of view our reform effort as kind of being uh, a stool with three legs. I guess that's a Vermont analogy that uh, used to work pretty well. And the first is hospital sustainability. And I think, you know, that is in process and uh, hopefully we'll be successful at the legislature. And I have great appreciation for what Jess's work on that with Elena and, and her team. So that's one leg. Um, the other is uh, the conversion of fee for service to true fixed perspective payments. And here I want to note that in our last budget year, uh, in the payer mix table uh, as a, that was in the guidance, that if you did the math, you found that uh, for commercial payers, uh, less than two percent of their payments to hospitals was true was fix, was any kind of fixed perspective payment. Not to say, uh, you know, true fixed perspective payment. And so I would just like to emphasize, uh, you know, what uh, Don George, and I'm very glad to see this in his letter to us uh, yesterday, where he says, we must turn determinedly toward value based payments and global hospital budgets to think more holistically about patient health rather than incentivizing volume by paying for each uh, service individually. And so for me, if you follow the money, there's not a lot of commercial activity in that element of, of, of reform. But hopefully, you know, uh, um, and, I, and I had had some conversations with Patrick about trying to beef that up somehow in the guidelines, and it just didn't work. Um, but um, it's a point I want to make that it's, 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 and I think this is in a line with Robin's talking about regulatory alignment, that we, that you know, we have hospitals saying they want to do it, and we have uh, commercial payers saying they want to do it, but it's not getting done. And um, so that's one point. And the other is, uh, is the third leg to me is the cost shift. And um, and I, I just want to note that, and I not that I fully understand what's going on uh, this year in the in the state budget process, but I note that in the terms of the e board and house passed. Uh, budget so far, the emergency board uh, recommendations in the House passed budget that there's a reduction in the amount of uh, Medicaid global commitment of about $20 million. And I don't know whether that is a um, is a choice that's being made or whether it's a restriction based on the 1115 global commitment waiver. Um, but I would ask that in the near term that we get DIVA before the board you know, so they can explain to us what the process is, you know, that is used in, in setting these reimbursement rates. Because, you know, if, if, the real, if there is a 20 million, 18 to $20 million cut, you know, in the 2023 budget, you know, that's the cost shift. And, uh, and, and, and we got to call it out if, if there's flexibility there. And, uh, um, and I don't know whether there is or not, but I'd like to have Diva before us to, explain the process of their recommendation to the emergency board and 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 as it car carries through the legislative process so that's uh i just want I, uh, those two areas are important to me and i think we're we're getting incredibly strong on one but there there's uh fpp is 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 kind of languishing um uh hopefully we make progress with medicare on uh, uh reconciliation but um and the cost shift is just an open wound in, 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 in my view, which, which even if we're successful on the hospital sustainability, it's the cost shift that can suck the vitality out of that. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Tom. Is there any further discussion from the board? 
If not, Russ, if you could call the roll. Uh, Member Holmes. Yes. Member Lunge. Yes. Uh, Member Pelham. Yes. Member Walsh. Yes. And uh, Chair Mullen. Yes. Let the record show the motion passed unanimously. Patrick, do you have anything else uh, for us on guidance? I do not know. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, and thank you for the staff's uh, hard work on these issues. Uh, Mike Barber, um, I know you're scheduled to go later today. Did you, do you want to stick to that schedule, or would you like to, um, since we have some time before noon, to um, have that discussion on CON thresholds now? Uh, whatever your preference is, Mr. Chair, I could I could do it now or I could see if there's time at the end of the day. My preference is we might be uh, fresher if you do it now. Sure, uh, just give me a minute to bring up the materials. While you're bringing up the materials, I see a hand up from Jeff Tiemann. Jeff, I'll recognize you at this time. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I would just um, maybe ask that this still happen later today. I know that Devin Green on my team wanted to participate and cannot right now, and it was scheduled to be discussed this afternoon, not right now. That is fine. We will uh, adjourn this meeting till one o'clock this afternoon and uh, proceed at that time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a, a good lunch and maybe uh, get some fresh air.